All right, we're going to go ahead and kind of introduce this. We're right at 2.30 as far as our starting time. Uh, open discussion. Glad all of y'all have come. Maybe we'll have some more come in. Steve, did you have a bunch of questions handed to you? I've had several. You've had several. Okay, so good. Um, I will serve as the runner of the microphone when we get outside of the initial questions here. Uh, but otherwise, I'm really going to turn this over to Steve and this panel and let them uh, drive the ship on this. But uh, we will pass the mic around uh, as need be when we get to that point. Steve, take it away. Well, welcome to the Open Forum. We haven't done this for several years, and so not only just last year, but a couple of years before that, we actually had more lecture type or presentation material. So we're glad that you're here. I'm the only guy without a tie, so I'm going to moderate here. <laughs> And, uh, of course, we've got Dan King next to me, and we have Kyle Pope. I'll put these in alphabetical order, not necessarily order of importance, but Brother Bruce Reeves. And uh, they either have spoken or are going to speak to us uh, during the lectures. Now, I should not have to say this, but since we have not done this a couple of years, give me two minutes just to sort of get some rules of engagement or what's the current buzzword, the norms for conversation, I think. Um, we don't determine orthodoxy here. We're not, we don't want to do that. It's not what we do. We're not brotherhood watchdogs. Somebody asked me several years ago when I took a position or did something they didn't like if I was trying to sell the farm. I'm not even sure I exactly know what that means, but my response was, who's got the deed? I, I don't have it. I couldn't sell it even if I wanted to, but we're not brotherhood police or watchdogs. What we do is we provide written and open oral forums for brethren to discuss various issues. That's what this is about. And we want to give people reasonable response, uh, opportunity for response, subject to editor discretion, either of our publications or Mark Mayberry editing the paper or um, me if I'm the moderator of the open forum. Now, we are trying to seek and find the truth. This is not just a one idea is as good as the other necessarily, or everybody's got an opinion like, you know, everybody's got a nose. Um, some are better than others, and some are more biblical than others. So we are trying to do that, but this is not about orthodoxy. So um, if we can go ahead, this is an open forum. We want your involvement, although we're going to start off. Uh, I want to let each of these three guys say whatever they want to say at the very beginning for five minutes or ten if they want to wax eloquent. Or, or pass if you want to. We don't necessarily have to do that. Um, we're going to have a microphone in the audience. Lance is going to do that. I used to enjoy being the runner and going out in the audience, but I, I can't do that anymore, although I should note I did come armed with a weapon. Uh, so be careful, guys. Um, so I, I, I'm going to exercise my moderator's right to interrupt, conclude, change the subject, call on somebody else, or flee if I need to. Um, we don't need applause. I don't think we'll have that. Amens are good. Um, and again, I will remind us, I keep beating this drum because I think we need to keep beating it. Truth Magazine, Truth Publication, CEI, uh, together, it, we're, we are not the church. We are not the Lord's church. We are individual Christians, and we want to observe biblical principles and teach biblical ideas. And so we'll observe uh, doing things decently and in order. Now, I've been given several questions, so I put them on the PowerPoint. We'll start with that. And I shared it with the, uh, with the guys earlier. And uh, the first question is, does James 5, 8, Revelation 3, 11, and 22, 7 um, indicate that Jesus was supposed to return in the first century? Um, the person who gave me these, uh, this question um, indicated this is something that grew out of yesterday's lecture. So I suppose... Since, you know, Jesus, I, I'm coming soon, or the coming of the Lord is at hand, um, but we may want to go different directions with that. Uh, Bruce said he would uh, tackle this question, and so I'm going to turn it to him, okay. and I, I may add something, or I may observe the Passover Sounds good. when you're done. I, I would say we need to be careful with some of these time indicators. Obviously, there are uh, occasions when they are dealing with imminence, uh, and the context makes that clear. But there's other times where it's certainty or it's anticipation even. And in the case of James chapter 5, if I can read that verse quickly, James chapter 5 and verse 7, Therefore be patient, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient, strengthen your hearts. I do believe that's talking about the return of Christ. And I believe that what he's saying there is that we need to all live in anticipation 
of that and faithfulness in that. Likewise, uh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11 and Revelation 22, 17, which talks about uh, coming and being a part of the bride and having a spiritual thirst. And so when we read these passages, we have to take the context in mind. And I, I personally don't feel that this is saying be ready for the destruction of Jerusalem or anything like that. I think we're talking about the final return of Christ and living in preparation and anticipation of that whatever time period somebody was living in. I would echo that. In uh, James 5, a lot of talk has been done about at hand, and there's at hand statements, egus or egizo, and I think the point has to be recognized that while often they do describe things that are happening very soon, very quickly, uh, they're relative terms. And Bruce and I, as we were helping with the 8070 doctrine debate, found numerous occasions in which you're talking about centuries. And that's one of the inconsistencies because 8070 guys want to say that means it's got to be right now. But if you can even find a few exceptions, uh, it shows it's not a hard, fast rule. And I would agree as well that I think James 5, 7, and also 8 are talking about the Lord's final coming. And I would argue it largely because of the points I made about parousia. Um, I think there that shows it is talking about an actual presence. I would underscore the idea that that uh, if if you were if you were the Lord and you wanted to keep your people ready all the time for His eventual coming, what would you do? What would you say? And I think the answer to that is you would say something like what He did say. What He did say keeps us on our toes at all times because we don't know when if he let's just say that he had said to them we know now that 2,000 years have passed since the original apostles approximately so what if he had told them well you know we got 2,000 years or so what what would have happened in the meantime is people would have been sloppy for 2,000 years wouldn't they and so we don't know whether that will turn into 6,000 years before it's over. We have no idea. But the point is, what the Lord did was precisely what the, the Lord intended to do, which was keep us on our toes at all times. That relative sense, too, what is soon and near for the Lord may not be what we would perceive as soon and near. Uh, and I think that's an important thing for us to, to recognize. I, I may go a slightly different direction with this, and as we talked among ourselves earlier, we knew that there could be several ways to go. I am presuming that uh, this question may have arisen out of uh, some of Kevin Kay's remarks yesterday. And Kevin, if you want to respond when I'm finished with this, I appreciated very much what you said about the hymns that we sing, Jesus is coming soon is one that uh, which um, fortunately did not make it in certain hymnal. <laughs> but um, so, some brethren have tried to defend that by saying, uh, well, you know, we can define it and make soon elastic meaning sudden, or well, they use passages like the ones on the screen. Um, that's, that is not a hymn that I like to sing. I don't select it to lead. Um, uh, Kevin, I liked your, your fix for it, except it has copyright issues. We can't, we can't mess with the lyrics, but... When I'm singing it, even somebody else leads it, my, my fix for it is, Jesus is coming, morning or night. Or <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you don't have copyright issues with that particularly, but I do think we need to pay attention to that. And I'll just say that the reason some hymns like that that brethren don't care for or think are even unscriptural are in there is because we, in, in a sense, this was a, a hymnal selected by the brethren. We put this survey out there and let the brethren choose out of the 1,836 hymns that were in the major largest selling hymnals of churches of Christ in the 20th century. And so that 550 that we harnessed that scored very high are all well-known hymns that you would have to have been under a rock somewhere not to, not to know. And my mantra with this hymnal and our publication group was, if we produce the best hymnal in the history of hymnals and nobody buys it or uses it, what is the point of the activity? But I'll make another point. So in other words, that, that hymn's in there not because the editors really liked it, but because we felt it would be missed 
Um, if, the, if the brethren, and there are several that are like that, I come to the garden alone is one that came up in a forum a few years ago. I, I, I don't lead that song either, though. If somebody else wants to, that's fine, because our other mantra was observe the right of individual conscience and congregational autonomy. If we put a hymn in that a congregation doesn't want to sing and the eldership wants to stamp in red ink, do not sing, or unscriptural, and I've seen that happen Never with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs yet, but I've seen it with other hymnals. They have a perfect right to do that. I'm, I'm okay with them doing that. As uh, long as they paid for the hymnal, it's theirs to do with as, as they want to. So, um, Kevin, I appreciated what you said, uh, and I understand where you're coming from. Um, do you want to respond to anything uh, that I or anything these guys said about James 5.8? I'm, I'm assuming that that's the, the Let me, let me the say question. one yeah. thing. Let me say one thing about that. Okay, I like the song. Okay, let's get that out in the open. I like the song. In fact, I love the song. Uh, and Revelation 22 and verse 20 is the answer to your question. What scripture, you ask, what scripture would justify that language? Revelation 22, verse 20. The Greek uses the word taku. That's the word for shortly or quickly or if you look it up in the dictionary, it says soon is one of the words. So Jesus said, behold, I am coming soon. Actually, he says, nai erko my taku. Indeed, I am coming soon, or I am coming quickly, or I am coming shortly, however you want to translate that. But the point is, that text says that. And that was the point that we were making here a moment ago with regard to whether you sing it or whether you say it. Uh, the idea is the Lord could come at any moment. And I can tell you that when he does come, it's going to be too soon for a lot of folks. I was thinking of a passage in Philippians. If you look in Philippians, um, Philippians chapter 4 Verse 5, and this isn't taku, this is uh, egus or egizo. Let your gentleness be known to all men, the Lord is at hand. And what I find interesting about that is, you know, that communicates the idea of nearness. But in this passage, it's not really even used as a time indicator. It's describing the Lord's presence among us. And I think that, um, you know, one of the mantras that 8070 folks like to say is, the Lord knows how to keep time. Well, that's, that's based on our perception of what we think time means and what it indicates. And I think uh, sometimes that will narrow some things much more than the actual wording of the Holy Spirit does. Okay, so I'll just say if Dan asked me to lead the hymn, I would lead it. I don't, I don't have a problem with it, except it wouldn't be one that I would select to put in, in, in a hymnal. And Kevin, again, I appreciate very much your, your major point, which is that we need to think about and have conversations about the scripturality of the hymns that we sing. That was one of our mantras also uh, in when we were assembling this, this hymnal. So, Kevin, did you want to say something? All right, uh, Lance is going to be the runner. Uh, a young lady, oh, okay. a young lady uh, came up to me after uh, my lecture and and mentioned, I think, these three passages. And my response to her was that, that there are many different comings uh, that are mentioned in the New Testament, and they don't all refer to the second coming. And so I think we have to uh, consider just what coming is under consideration. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly, and I can't recall the reference off the top of my head, but in at least some of the letters to the seven churches, uh, Jesus uh, says that he's going to come quickly or come soon uh, either to bless that church or to punish that church. That's not a reference to the second coming. And... Um, I have interpreted Revelation 22, 7 as a reference to Jesus coming uh, soon in judgment on Rome, if that is the focus of the book of Revelation, or if you take the early date, his judgment on Jerusalem. And so I think that is 
at least a possibility that, that we should consider with respect to Revelation 22 and verse 7. I appreciated um, Kyle's observation just a moment ago because it's my understanding that these, uh, these terms that are translated at hand or near can refer, depending upon the context, either to time or uh, uh, presence, nearness in, in um, location. And so that would be another factor that I think we need to think about. Is this talking about the Lord uh, being close in time or in location to the saints? Anybody else? All right, well, let's move on. We have some other questions. Oh, Ron? Ron Halbert's got his hand up. Here's a mic. Matter. Oh. James 5 reminds me of Hebrews 1 that he has spoken to us through his son in these latter days. If this is the last dispensation, the Lord is coming soon in regard to there's not another era. There's no gap. The next thing that happens is the Lord comes. So I think that may be the reference in James and some similar passages. Just a thought. Okay. Let's shift gears. We can always recircle and come back to it. So does Matthew 10:28? teach that the soul is annihilated in hell, taking the Greek term for destroy into consideration. You may want to give the mic back to Ron. I don't know. <laughs> but these guys are up on the stage, so I'll, I'll let them start. Well, I think a classic answer to that is uh, that same word will be used for wineskins. You're not talking about something that is annihilated. You're talking about something that is in ruin. And I think the biggest issue is that Scripture teaches that God did create us with an eternal spirit. And that being the case, that destruction is applied to an eternal spirit. We're not talking about annihilation. Uh, is that it? All right. Well, all right. Yeah. Ryan, Again, just real quick. Uh, to me, the best easy answer is verse 6. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's the same Greek word. He did not mean the sheep have been annihilated. How would you preach to them? It's ruin. Yeah. So my answer is no. <laughs> Does First Peter three nineteen and four six mean that souls in Hades have the gospel preached to them and get a second chance, gentlemen? Or Ron simple again, answer: No. <laughs> they do not get a second chance. They, the the reference in in four six has to do with. The spirit's in prison. I suppose that's what we're talking about here, the spirit's in prison. And the text, the context says that these were the people to whom the gospel was being preached by Noah in the days when Noah was building the ark. So those people are in Hades. That's what the text seems to say. And no, uh, this, uh, the Christ... They had the gospel preached to them before is the whole point of the text. And um, hopefully you have something you want to add? Yes, sir. Uh, in chapter 1, I think it answers that a little bit because there is it speaks about prophecy. Um, and let's start in chapter 1, verse 10. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicated. So the sense in which Christ preached to the spirits who are now in prison, it's not saying he did it while they were in prison. The Spirit of Christ in uh, the preaching that happened prior to that is what's being described. Kevin Cage got a hand up, so if we can get him the mic. You, anybody else on the, on the panel want to comment? All right. Well, I'm going to get into all kinds of trouble. <laughs> um, <laughs> personally, I think that the Kevin, could, could you hold it a little closer? To your yeah. Um, I can't hear you. I, <laughs> I think the explanation that brethren tend to give of First Peter three is unlikely. 
uh, it seems to me that the best that uh, you can um, argue in the typical argument that is made is that, that that's a possibility, but it, it doesn't prove that that's actually what happened. And then it seems to me that there is a, uh, a progression in this passage from Jesus' death to his resurrection. Uh, verse 18, Christ also suffered once for sins, um, being put to death in the flesh, made alive by the Spirit, and then it talks about him going and preaching to the spirits in prison. Um, hold that while I scroll here. Um, and then, let's see, um, you've got a reference to the resurrection in verse 22 or 21, and then a reference to his ascension in verse 22 and his enthronement at the right hand of God, the explanation that, that um, Christ preached uh, through Noah um, seems to me to ignore this progression uh, in the passage. Uh, also, the word preached here is not, is not the word um, that is normally used for, it's not the uh, evangelion word or however you would pronounce that. I think it's a, it's a, it's a different word for proclamation. Uh, I understand Peter to be saying that, that uh, Christ proclaimed his victory um, to spirits that were imprisoned now, whether that's angelic beings or whether that is disembodied spirits, that's, that is a debated question. Whether this happened during the three days uh, of his entombment or whether it happened during the 40 days uh, before he ascended or on his way to heaven in the ascension, those are debated questions. Um, but I, I think that progression in the passage is, is something that um, is important. And the, the explanation of him preaching through Noah, um, I think, ignores that progression. I think it was Augustine who first proposed this preaching through Noah argument. And it was... It, it, kind of took the day, um, but anyway, my, my comments. Okay, thank you. A little longer than two minutes, but I, I appreciate the, the question. That's, that's all right. Uh, we just, uh, anybody up here? Uh, yeah. Go on, Kyle, go ahead. Yeah. Well, one thought with that, though, and I appreciate the point about the progression, but notice in First Peter 3, in verse 18, I think the emphasis is the spirit that he was put to death in flesh, flesh but made alive by the spirit by whom also. So it's really talking about the source of the, and yes, it's keruso, uh, the word for announce or proclaim. It's not euangelion um, that's used there, or euangelizo, but uh, it's still the same idea. He announced this by whom? By the Spirit. And that's the same point that's made back in chapter 1. So I don't think it's that much of a stretch to connect it with the source of the revelation and it's connecting Christ's activity with that. It was the Spirit of Christ. It was the Holy Spirit as well that, that was involved in Christ's resurrection. All right. Um, the person who handed me this question indicated that it arose out of uh, one of yesterday's lectures, which I presume would be Ron. So, again, Ron, do you want to respond to this? Or um, if you can get, get him a mic there, Lance. Uh, first of all, First Peter 4, in that passage... The dead, I believe there, he's simply referring to like those who have died ahead of us. And so it doesn't mean they were preached to after their death. He's just saying they were preached to. Now they're dead. 
They died in faith. Uh, in 1 Peter 3, my understanding there would be that the spirits are specified who heard the message. It is those who sometime were disobedient in the days of Noah. So to me, that roots that one in a time frame. This is something that happened in the days of Noah. And the, the reason it's impossible is, you know, Luke 16 makes clear there's no change that can take place. Once a spirit is assigned to prison, Hades, that change can't happen. And, and one of the questions that I would have is if, if the, why the importance of bringing up the spirits that are in prison while the ark was preparing? What, what's the importance of that unless that's the crowd he's talking about? And let's just say the Savior went to Hades. Why the particular interest in that particular crowd when all the other ages have passed in the meantime? What is the importance of that particular group of people that the Savior had to proclaim it to them? Um, it, it leaves me with no answer. It, it, in my view, it has to be while the ark was preparing that whatever proclaiming was done was done then. So if Augustine introduced the idea, Augustine was right in my book. You want me to move on? Um, yeah, well, I've been, been given another question, which is not on the PowerPoint, so Bruce has the question, and now he has a mic, so okay. go ahead. Here we go. Uh, it's regarding 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50. As we understand the resurrection, there will be a bodily resurrection. At what point will our bodies be changed to an incorruptible body? Um, and I appreciate the question. Verse 50, I think, has been at times misunderstood and almost defined to lead somebody to the conclusion that it's not really a bodily resurrection. I don't think the person asking the question believes that. But the scripture says, Now I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. I think in the context, flesh and blood here is not just reference to any kind of body, but to a corruptible body, to a mortal, perishable body. Now he goes on to tell us when that happens, he says in verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So I don't have the notion that, that this is somehow a, a progressive process that's going on. Uh, it seems to me in the twinkling of an eye, at that last trump, we will be those who have our resurrection body, and it will be immortal. And I, maybe I'm missing the point of the question here, but uh, that's what I've got. Um, yeah, read sure. the question again. Could you read it? Okay, sure. <laughs> okay. As we understand in the resurrection, there will be a bodily resurrection. At what point will our bodies be changed to an incorruptible body? That, I would agree that we're talking about that twinkling of an eye when that will happen. I might just add um, a little subtlety, and I, I, I mentioned last night after Ron's lecture that I at one time had held, accepted Ed Fudge's view, and one of the powerful things that had led me to accept it was the argument that they make about immortality, because they will make the argument that Scripture only describes God as immortal. And while I, know, I reject his conclusions, I, I have found what I believe is a subtlety in Scripture about that. Um, in Greek, as well as in English, that which is immortal is that which is not subject to death. And as I find it used in Scripture, immortal is only ever applied to God or to those after the twinkling of an eye. Now, that doesn't mean there is an annihilated spirit. The Bible does speak of man as having an eternal spirit. But I really think it gets us around that problem that the annihilationists uh, take some, uh, uh, get some strength in. Because if we understand scripturally, it is the righteous that are promised an immortal, incorruptible body. The unrighteous are never promised that. They are promised an eternity in which they're subject to the second death. So properly, they're not immortal in that sense. 
and they are eternally subject to corruption. Um, I, I would have read this if I had been able to finish my lecture, but uh, on page... <laughs> I didn't mean that. I, you know what I mean. Ran out of time. Ran out of time. 366 in the book. This is a, a quote from Justin Martyr, and I offered it in the context because it offers some examples of parousia, but he also makes some interesting points about immortality. And here's, here's what he says. And I apologize for my bad eyes. I've got to juggle things here. He says, For the prophets have proclaimed two advents, parousia, of his. The one, that which is already past, well, when he came as a dishonored and suffering man, but the second, when according to prophecy, he shall come from heaven with glory accompanied by his angel, his angelic host, when, all, uh, when also he shall raise the bodies of all men. So it's not just the collective, like the 8070 folks say, at least in his understanding, of all men who have lived, and shall clothe the, those of the worthy with immortality, and shall send those of the wicked, now notice the way he words this, endued with eternal sensibility into everlasting fire with the wicked devils. He doesn't call them immortal, and I find that interesting that here it's a Greek speaker in the second century. Uh, just a quick point from Romans 2 to Kyle's point, I think. If you look at the parallelism here in Romans chapter 2 and in verse 7, to those who by perseverance and doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Then if you come down to verse 10, very similar, but there's a, a word change there. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Uh, if you look at glory, honor, and peace. And so he seems to be using those terms in that, in that way. And I appreciate it. I think Ron noted in a footnote that I had mentioned that to him about eternal spirit. And I appreciate you, you doing that. So directly answering the question, the point at which that will happen is when the Lord returns when he comes again. He will change our bodies. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 tells us here. In the twinkling of an eye, that's when it will happen. So, Let me just add a moderator point, and then Mike, if you can get him, um, Mike Willis would like to say something. Um, one of the things that I appreciate about the, this lecture, not just this year, but other years, and all you guys that are here, and you know Ron and, and the rest of Joe and the rest of you who've spoken is Kevin, too, um, sometimes when we look at a text, um, we can tell what it says, although sometimes it may be not as clear to us as we'd like, but what we've heard this week also addresses what it does not say. That is, what other people have tried to twist the scripture into saying, and that has not been done with rancor or in, in any kind of, of, of indebted sense, but we've had very clear teaching about not only what does the text say, but here are some things that the text does not teach that other people have said. And I appreciate the, the way that that's been done. Uh, Mike's uh, got a mic, so go yeah, ahead. I was just going to make the point that the body that is raised from the grave is raised immortal. The thing that is changed in a moment in the twinkling of the eye is the body of the living, not that which is raised from the grave. And I'm sure that's what y'all would understand yes. as well. All right. We had another hand, I think, over here, right behind you, Lance. Do a 180. Oh. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wolfgang mentioned uh, at the beginning this is individual Christians not necessarily representing the church body, and, and I appreciate that. And Mr. King also mentioned um, there are many that are going to be unprepared uh, in the end. So my, my question is, um, what are some ways personally that you all, and I'd love to hear from each one, um, that you have had experience being able to reach and warn those who are outside the body that are unprepared? Who wants to start? Well, I talked to them talk to them about death. Obviously, for a lot of people, um, death is the real danger. Of course, you and I believe the Lord's going to come again. But 
as far as they're concerned, the only reality that they deal with on a daily basis is the ugly shadow of death that falls upon all of us, and we see it. So we have to talk to people about the more immediate danger while at the same time mentioning as time goes by to people uh, when you come to faith, you also come to the understanding that the Lord said he's coming again. And so uh, for people who have not yet come to faith, the more, uh, the more immediate danger is death. And what's going to happen to you when you die? And so that's, that's what I suppose most of us probably do is we reason from the, the more immediate to the eventual. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 2 says better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting for uh, that is the end of all men and the living will take it to heart. I think it seems to be that in most people's lives they're not really going to think much about their own end or the end of the world until certain things confront them, either illness, uh, some kind of disaster, the, the death of a family member or something like that. And often that can be, I think, the ideal time to try to help call people to consider those things. Um, certainly there are other times when life's going good that we need to help them see that as well, but that's kind of an opportunity that presents itself fairly often in people's lives. Why didn't I go first? <laughs> Were you going to say that? Yeah. yeah, no, that's okay. I was going to say with, with some of the circumstances recently in our country and in the world, I personally have found it easier to talk to some people about those very things because it's, it's in front of you, and they may have lost loved ones. And it just seems to me, to reiterate some of this, that uh, sometimes we don't see that tribulations and trials are the most opportune time to talk about spiritual things. And so I hope that we'll take advantage of that now uh, as Christians uh, to steer people away from the physical and to focus more on the, on the spiritual. I don't know if that answered your question, but I hope so. I'll take a stab at it since you said you wanted to hear from everybody. Um, in some ways, it's hard for preachers other than in the circumstances that have been described because preachers are kind of scary to some people, especially those who, who may need the gospel more than any I found, I think it's partly paying attention to your context that is not necessarily for many other people who are not preachers. I mean, when I, when I was teaching at the University of Kentucky, I had in some ways more opportunities to talk about the gospel with students, uh, usually after class. I mean, you can't use the classroom as a, a proselyting device, but other, even other faculty members are, are guest speakers. And so I think we have to work each within our own context. You mentioned individuals. Um, we do a, to, to try to get out into the community more than just, uh, we, we do a meetup study, and I know some other places do that. We meet in a coffee shop uh, in a Chicago suburb across from the train station. We get a lot of foot traffic. Um, that's something that I do personally. I pay for the fees out of my pocket, uh, so it's not a church function, but I think to that degree that we can each get out into the community where we are and use context that we may find that are kind of outside of preaching context, not, not to diminish that because all that these brothers have said is certainly true. Um, I, one of the things that pops to mind is because of the invading secularism and the increasing godlessness in our country, I think we've all experienced, those of us that are older, that, that the gospel is not as welcome in many places and it's not as, we're not as able to free, freely discuss the gospel as we were, say, in the 1960s which was also a huge social turmoil point. And so maybe places like the, the Philippines or Eastern Europe or Australia or China, where, where some of us have been, some of you in the audience have been overseas more than I have, but I, I think we may need to turn our attention, uh, broaden our horizons, if you will, to look for people who are actually interested in the gospel because it's not my task to try to pick out somebody and say, I'm going to convert them and force them to you know, force feed them the gospel. It's, it's the job of, of any preacher or any Christian for that matter to, to find someone who's interested, needs the gospel and knows that they need the gospel and share that with them. Now, so that's my piece. If somebody else wants to, to jump in, I don't know if that addresses your question or not, but 
right. Anybody else want to comment? I think that follows the that yeah. follows the pattern that the Lord instructed the disciples. It said yeah. when yes. you yes. when people turn a deaf ear, what you do is shake the dust off yeah. your feet and go somewhere else. Yeah. Don't just despair, sit there and despair and and say there's no hope. No, there's hope. It, you just have to look for it someplace else. That's good. You know, the, the figure of planting and watering is often used with respect to evangelism and trying to help people become prepared. And all of us are preachers and the efforts that we try to make in terms of either personal contacts or preaching in a pulpit or writing or things like that, all of those in one respect or another are efforts to try to help people pr be prepared. And I think, you know, the idea is you just sow the seed as best you can, wherever you can. Well, we are out of questions. Oh, we have a hand in the back, Lance, if you can get a mic back to the back. And if you have more questions, let them be churning to the surface, all right? Or otherwise, I don't mind dismissing us and saying, let's go to the bookstore or you know, whatever. I mean, we don't have to go until uh, 4 o'clock unless you want to. So, yes, brother? Where are the beignets today? Where are the beignets today? <laughs> Where's the what? Beignets. Oh. <laughs> I, that wasn't what I was going to say. Um, I, I wouldn't advocate this in the pulpit, but in our personal conversations, uh, allowing and encouraging our friends that are out in the world to talk about the emptiness of their life. Um, because this postmodern secular world offers nothing fulfilling. And while in the pulpit I'm going to talk about sin and righteousness, I don't know that in my personal conversations that's the best place to start. Uh, but allowing people to verbalize how empty their life feels, I think opens a door for us to show them how it could be fulfilled. Good point. Um, we got three hands now. I saw Ron's and then Mike's and then Kevin K. So take your pick, Lance. I'm going the order you mentioned. Them. Okay. Do you... <laughs> Do you have the two questions I sent in advance? Uh, Our email, via email? I, I do yeah. not. Do you? Matthew 24, let each of them. I didn't get it. But, but, uh, oh, I'm sorry, okay. I, I didn't get the message, but, okay. I, but you and I spoke, and so I know what the question is. The question well, I've got, well, there were two, so since you'll have the mic, you can just use the time for that. But the first was, what is the strongest point you see that Matthew 24 would have that heartbreak at 35, 36. And number two, the paragraph that uses that apocalyptic type language, is that literal or public? How do you clarify that passage? Because I know the two of you have a different view of that. I just wanted to hear how you each would explain it. Thank you. Um, obviously, our crowd, I, I don't know how we're split up in terms of people's perspective on Matthew 24, but I know what my experience has been down through the years, that there are, um, there are various views in regard to how to approach Matthew 24. I take what's usually called the traditional view. Kyle set forth uh, J.W. McGarvey's view, which is uh, pretty good company to be in, I might say. And the great thing about that in a crowd like this is is that probably about 95 percent of of what he had to say I completely agree with uh, at the same time there are a few things that I would disagree with and I allow me just a moment to register some of those things uh, my approach down through the years with regard to Matthew 24 and the parallel texts which are in Luke 21 and in Mark 13 I tended and have always tended to take Mark 13 and Luke 21 as destruction of Jerusalem passages. Obviously, they're very short. They're much briefer, and they do not include the material that begins at, at verse 36 and goes to the, to the end of chapter 25. Obviously, there is that element, that radical uh, preterist element, that all of us are united in agreement in opposing. Uh, and that suggests that all of Matthew 24 and all of Matthew 25 were fulfilled 
at 70 AD. I've never been able to get that. I, I, honestly, I, I, I've ne been completely unimpressed with that theory. However, in re I understand the approach that Kyle takes, which to me has always been a little bit confusing to jump from one to the other to the other has always been a bit confusing to me. I understand his reasoning. At the same time, I agree with him in terms of the, the liberal uh, or the literal usage of the word parousia. Parousia means exactly what he said it meant. Uh, it is about presence. At the same time, the other verb or the other word that is used in parallel, I might add, in various contexts, is the word erkomai. Erkomai is used in passages such as Matthew 16, 28. In Matthew 16, 28, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, what does that mean? I believe that is a figurative passage that figuratively describes the Lord's coming. I believe erkomai is a direct parallel with parousia in terms of their meanings. Uh, it, by the way, is utilized, I mentioned it a few moments ago, in relation to Revelation 22 and verse 20, which uses the same verb, erkomai. And the Lord said he was coming soon or quickly. So that's the point in regard to that. Now, coming back to the larger issue, framing the reference of verses 1 to 35 and then verses 36 to the rest, to the end of the, the discussion. Uh, in my view, the first part of the chapter deals with the destruction of Jerusalem. I realize there is some language there that is highly symbolic. I believe it is used in a figurative way. I believe that, that those of us who disagree in regard to this and to how that is, is uh, realized, that we don't have big issues between us, and I don't think we ought to fight over it or quarrel over it. Amen. It's just not worth it. Uh, at the same time, my view is that from 1 to 35, is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. It is directly parallel with Mark 13 and Luke 21 from verse 35 and, uh, and following, verse 36 and following rather, is the second coming of Christ. And so let these guys have their comments. Well, um, let me just mention in uh, accordance with what Dan said, we could even add to that Matthew chapter 24, verse 30, Erkomai is used there, the coming of the Son of Man. Mm. So, so there, there is a sense in which they can be used parallel. Um, what, I have, what I've been unable to find is a place in which parousia is clearly, unquestionably used in a figurative sense. And I think we have, we've some, now I tried to make it clear in my lecture Yes, there are absolutely times in which comings can be referred to in a spiritual, figurative, or representative sense. But I remember a number of years ago talking to a full preterist, and they were actually talking about um, time statements. And they, were, they asked the question, how could the Lord have expressed it any more clearly that he was coming uh, immediately than uh, at hand or things like that? Well, I look at this word parousia, how could he have expressed it any more clearly that he's talking about his actual presence? Let me, let me give you a Justin quote again. Uh, this was the last one I was going to use in my lecture. And I'll tell you, when I, when I first came across this, it knocked me out of my seat. I called you that day and said, Bruce, Bruce, this is great. <laughs> it, it's the very last one I have. It's on page 367. Now, this is a second century Greek speaker. And... He is using parousia, but I want you to notice he also uses the verb form. Uh, one thing that I, I wasn't able to mention is, you know, when Paul, in one of the quotes that I offered, he'll use parousia and kind of a contrasting verb, apousia. So present, absent. Um, 
I was recently teaching in 1 Corinthians 5 and realized the verb forms are used that way. I'm absent from you, um, but as if I was present. And I use the verb form. Well, notice here. Here's, here's Justin's quote. Now, he's commenting on Genesis 49, verses 8 through 12. And if you're familiar with that, this is a text that refers to washing his garments in the blood of the grapes. And an early Christian interpretation of that was that this is talking about Christ's blood. Um, but here's his quote. He says, For the Holy Spirit called those who receive remission of sins through him his garments, amongst whom he is always, and here's the verb form, present, paremi, in power, but will be manifestly, and the word that he uses here in argos means palpably, visibly, and then he uses the verb form again, manifestly present, paremi, in his second parousia. And my, my question there is, how could Justin, as a Greek speaker, sees that that's making it clear that we're talking about an actual presence? Now, let me back up just a minute into Ron's question about um, what's the best argument or why do I see it that way? Um, a couple of things. When I first began working on the Matthew commentary and I got to the Olivet Discourse, I realized what a mountain of, of material had been written about that. And I decided just to take a pencil and paper and go through and try to track it. And if you've seen my 8070 book or you've seen the Matthew commentary, there are three charts in there that, that were the result of that, in which I tried to just kind of track what it says. And a few things kind of I found odd because I, I don't rely exclusively on early Christian writing, but it does show us how early Christians understood some of these things. And when you see people like Justin talking about literal clouds, trumpet, coming with angels, same kind of language as the cosmological language there in the Olivet Discourse. I find that interesting. How do we, how do we add that into it? When I came across parousia in the Olivet Discourse, from my understanding of the worst word, that root word, usia, being, it's describing him actually being beside them, being with them, being present with them. And so if that's part of the question, and then you see it in verse 27, and then you see it in verse 37 and 39, why would we imagine it's literal in 37 and 39 and not verse 27? Add to that the issue of the end. If my argument is sound that Matthew throughout is describing end of the age three times in chapter 13 and then once in chapter 28 of the end of the world, final judgment, then it seems most reasonable that's the same way it's being used in 24.3. And so if end there, uh, you've got three times before verse 34 that end is referenced. Now, you told me afterwards you appreciated that I said hard transition. I'm not saying there aren't transitions. I'm saying that he contrasts. And he'll, he'll say, it's not this, but it's that. It's not this, but it's that. And I think there is a usefulness of the whole discourse to either 8070 or final judgment that I think he, he utilizes in, in that way. Um, and finally, on the cosmological language, I just find it, I think what we've sometimes done is we, we've said, all right, uh, to counter premillennial arguments that this is all future, and even abomination of desolation's future, we we'll use that cosmological language and say it's figurative. But then the problem we run into is the same wording is used in 1 Thessalonians 4. Same wording is used in, uh, in Peter and things such as that. And I tend to think what we're looking at is Jesus lays the foundation for those concepts that then Peter and Paul build upon, and James builds upon, and John builds upon, rather than him using it figuratively and the others then um, taking it literally. One of the keys, I think, to understanding this is, is understanding the principle of duplicative um, 